What is up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Den of Geek Presents Marvel Standing Live, where each week we give you the deepest possible dives on all the goings on in the MCU, Marvel Comics, and beyond. With me for all time and always, we have Den of Geek TV editor Alec Bajalid, and not one, but two special guests. Please welcome back to Marvel Standom, pop culture writer and Den of Geek contributor Joe George, and Den of Geek senior movies editor David Crow. And I got to say, folks, after six torturous weeks with Moon Knight, we finally have something good to talk about again with the absolutely bonkers Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Word of warning, first and foremost, we are going to be talking major spoilers about this movie all through the show today. So if you haven't seen it yet, you might not want to hang around here. Come back and listen or watch after you've seen it. If you want to go into this knowing as little as possible, you've been warned. Second, make sure you're reading all our coverage of this movie at denigeek.com slash Marvel. We do have a spoiler-free review there, as well as deep dives on the ending, the post credit scene, and much more that will be dropping all through the weekend and into next week. Now, there is a lot. This movie packs an awful lot into two hours and six minutes. What did everybody think about this? David, you're our senior movies editor. You're also probably the biggest Sam Raimi fan I know. What do you think of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness? Well, thanks. Uh, I mean, honestly, I, uh, obviously we knew Sam was, has, was directing it for years, but I went in with modest expectations. As you know, I'm not the typical Marvel stand around the office, but uh, holy hell did this surprise me in a really great and fun way. Uh, the movie is dripping with Raimi's personality and not since, you know, Taika Waititi or James Gunn have I seen a Marvel movie that felt so stylishly individual. You really feel Raimi's twisted, but also I would say good humored in a mean, mean spirited way personality that's just coming through this movie in spades. It's still a Marvel movie. I think it should satisfy most audiences with an open mind for a slightly different flavor of Marvel. But you know, I feel like uh, Stefan on SNL. This movie has it all. It has Dutch angles. It has demonic possession, souls of the damned, Bruce Campbell's chin, uh, and it's fun for the whole family. I really do think that. So yeah, <laughs> Joe, how about you? Yeah, I'm gonna almost echo exactly what David said. I mean, I went into it with low expectations, like it's going to be like Eternals where there's nothing of the great director who's working on it, you know? And, and so it kind of, my reaction was like that um, uh, Vince McMahon meme where it's, you know, like first thing, Oh, the camera spins. And I'm like, mm -hmm. and then uh, we get a, you know, whip pan. Oh, and then, you know, by the time we get to whatever's going on in the exposition scene with the dark hold where, you know, it's, it's cross fades and the camera spinning around and uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor's face is in the middle of a circle. I was just pumping my fist all the way. I don't know what the story of this movie is and I don't care. This was a Sam Raimi movie and I loved it. Loved every second of it. Alec, I'm going to kick this over to you because you were my fellow sufferer with Moon Knight. You know, Joe uh, Joe was more measured and, and enjoyed that show more than we did. So did Kirsty, who unfortunately can't join us this week. But Alec, did this restore your faith in the current state of the MCU? Yes. Very well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, look, I love this movie. Um, like it, it's, it, I don't know how much else I can say other than what David and Joe have already said, just cause it's, it's just a fun movie, man. It's also, it's cool that it's only like two hours, six minutes, or maybe like even less than two hours with credits. It does have a distinct visual style and it is, it's just so hilariously violent and bloody. Um, it, it just, you know, we're, we're like, what, 26, 27 movies into this whole uh, filmmaking franchise now, and it's kind of hard to top oneself or do something different. And in a lot of cases, you know, Doctor Strange doesn't necessarily do that. You can see the Marvel formula kind of baked into it. But from a stylistic perspective, it absolutely does. Um, it's, it's essentially Mar Marvel's first horror movie, which feels corny to say, because it feels like we've been trying to will that into existence. I know we said that Moon Knight would be Marvel's first horror movie. It's like we had like five or six false alarms for Marvel's first horror movie. 
Um, but it's pretty fair to say that this is like terrifying and gross and bloody and cool. Um, yeah, I just loved it. I think it was just entertaining as hell. Yeah, I I went in with pretty low expectations. Like, even though I, you know, I love Sam Raimi, um, I just have not really been knocked out by three of the last four MCU projects, you know, and and also, look, I mean, longtime watchers of this show know that I have really mixed feelings about the multiverse being something that Marvel leans on. And I think we're kind of in this weird period of, of like strangely kind of multiverse saturation in some ways. So like I went in there with pretty low expectations and I had such a good time like from the word go. And a lot of my usual MCU criticisms, you know, the special effects were good. You know what I mean? This didn't have that washed out look that I feel like every other MCU project has. Um, you know, we had a director who was clearly allowed to direct um, and it was not a ridiculously bloated runtime. Now, I do understand, like, is it possible this movie maybe tries to do a little bit too much in 126 minutes? Yeah, sure. I, I could I could see that. But you know, I just, I had such a good time with it. Walking out of there, my initial impression was that this is a top five MCU movie. And I don't know if that's going to hold up. I honestly don't. Um, like, I'm curious to see if I feel that way after a second or a third viewing. Um, but I was really high on this and I really had a good time. Yeah, I, I would actually say I've seen some criticisms out there about the movie, the movie's plot being nonsensical, which it is, but us and that it's a, uh, narratively light but maybe it's because i'm a bit i'm more of a marvel skeptic when it comes to their films i find a lot of them are narratively very light i mean what was the plot of spider-man no way home other than you know a very contrived excuse to get you know three generations of spider-man actors together and if you enjoy that that's great it works on that level but this the plot was just an excuse to have some fun and i do think it is a lot of fun it is gothic it is it, i mean it, again it has possession and we'll get into it some people die in some very nasty ways but is it a horror movie i if it is i think it's a horror movie for the whole family like, again like when i when i was a kid ghostbusters scared me the first one you know zool uh which also now that i think about it has possession involved in that and that was scary but i also loved that movie as a kid and then as you get older you can appreciate it in different ways and do I think that uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness will scare some kids? Yes, I think under 10 is a, will be a bit iffy and, you know, it's up to the parents in that situation. But I think kids will enjoy being scared by it of, if they're of a certain age and sensibility. And I think uh, it's nice to see uh, a Marvel movie with a different seasoning. Yeah, I have a, I'm going to speak as a, as a dad here. I've got a five-year-old and a 10-year-old. I will let them watch this movie. Um, I, I know my five-year-old's going to be scared by it, but it's that Raimi is such a good start for like a starter horror movie because he is so, you know, silly. Like he can be mean-spirited, but there's that, there is that Three Stooges goofy element that's always underpinning his scary stuff. And so, you know, when Shuma Gorath's eye gets ripped out, I know he, my five-year-old's going to cover his eyes. My 10-year-old will pump her fist, but uh, my five-year-old will cover his eyes. And that's cool. That's part of, you know, that's part of introducing them to new things. And that's part of the fun. I wish now as a bitter old horror movie fan that I could feel those feelings again. So I'm doing what all parents do and living vicariously through my children. So I second David's opinion on that. The presence of uh, Shima Gorath was so funny to me because I've been playing Breath of the Wild lately and like half the big enemies in that have a big eyeball you have to attack. <laughs> I just love that like anytime in like a video game or a movie, if a monster with an enormous eyeball is presented, like there's really not a lot of mystery as to how you take it down. <laughs> like like I, I wonder what we do to this giant one eyeball monster. <laughs> this isn't even like a Marvel Comics Easter egg. It's a it's a comics industry Easter egg in how they handle uh, Shumagoroth here, which is that like they take him out with an injury to the eye. And I, I use those words very specifically, injury to the eye, because when the Comics Code Authority 
was kind of implemented in the 1950s after the Senate subcommittee hearings on the connection between comic books and juvenile delinquency after like the explosion of crime and horror comics uh, as superheroes were on the downturn after World War II. One of the specific things that the comics code absolutely forbids is showing injuries to the eye. Like, and that's, you know, in part because during those hearings, when they were showing off, like, all the ways that comics were corrupting the youth of America, they'd be showing these, like, you know, these EC comics, like, crime suspense stories and Tales from the Crypt and stuff like that, with, like, people, like, like I think the one idea was, like, a syringe going into somebody's eye. And you know what? You can't tell me that Sam Raimi wasn't, like, you know, who is so culturally aware of all of that stuff wasn't deliberately playing with that here it's like i'm going to put the most graphic injury to the eye imaginable in a superhero movie like i i have to feel that was intentional i really do yeah i i wonder if uh Raimi and uh kevin feige are a little bit bummed that basically the suicide squad which you know maybe not enough people saw anyway did the same thing with Starro, except Harley Quinn do- dove into the eye with a spear. And that's that's hard to one-up, especially with the PG-13 rating. You know, I'll also say, by the way, just since we're talking so much about the horror vibes of this movie, like, it is just vibes. Like, it's not really Marvel's horror movie, but it does come pretty close, especially, like, especially late in the movie, which I'm totally down for. I always felt that you know, Scott Derrickson's Doctor Strange movie got a little bit of a raw deal. It got saddled with a very traditional origin story. And like a great horror director like Scott Derrickson never got to explore the kind of weirdness that this character is truly known for, you know? And I do feel like Sam and company get to do that here, you know? Like, even though I'm already tired of the multiverse, like I'm already tired of like the fan service and everything else, this still managed to feel closer to the Doctor Strange movie that I wanted for a long time than, you know, than I than I possibly would have expected. You know, it's still still not my platonic ideal of a Doctor Strange movie, but like I'll take it. I'm we're we're making progress here. That's funny. You mentioned getting sick of um the multiverse. And I think that one of this movie's uh best qualities is that it kind of doesn't care about the multiverse, at least not on a level that a lot of other stuff does recently. Um, Like this is less science fiction than like everything everywhere all at once. Not only that, but like going into this movie, given that the, you know, the writer hails from Rick and Morty and given that Loki um, took its, you know, multiverse conceit very seriously, I was kind of like pleasantly surprised to, to discover how much more, magic and sorcery was involved um, with the central plot of this movie and the mechanics of it than like an actual attempt at deep understanding of multiverses and how they work. Uh, it really works well in the movie's favor, particularly at, you know, at, the, at that two hour runtime. I think like that, that's why that runtime works is because they just say like, you know, it's magic <laughs> for a lot of it. Uh, and it also helps contribute to those vibes we talk about, those horror vibes where we're just like getting to some really dark magical things. Um, yeah, I enjoy that. Yeah, I feel that's true of the entire story and plot. I mean, and, and I know we'll get into some of the problems with the story that, that people have, but for me, the, the, the story was just a skeleton on which to hang set pieces. And it, as long as the set pieces were glorious, I was okay with it. So I didn't care about any of that stuff. And especially when your multiverse stuff, as opposed to No Way Home, which is all, you know, look at that guy, I know this guy. They do that for 10 seconds and then we're going to blow up the heads of the guy that you're so happy to see right now. So, yeah, it's a, that's I think it's a perfect example of the we don't really care about the story. This is all about set piece and we'll give you your your, your fan service. But then that's going to lead to a crazy set piece in which we blow up the heads of the people that you're pleased to see. Well, tied into that, I mean, actually, one of my, my real only and it's very minor criticisms of how this movie is structured is what you mentioned everything everywhere all at once which is maybe a little more out of the mainstream than what marvel's wanting to do but you know the daniels the directors of that wonderful movie say if you're doing the multiverse why settle for 10 universes why settle for three you could you could do infinity you can certainly do i think there are hundreds in that movie obviously marvel wasn't going to do something that 
uh, confounding, but I was wondering why we're spending so much time in this one multiverse after, you know, the montage or where only spend time in really two other dimensions, primarily in the film. And one of them is pretty much the entire second act. And you're thinking, why are they doing this? And to me, again, perfectly Sam Raimi, it's the sensibility of setting up a joke. And the joke is that the Illuminati, and we can get into the fan service here, it's everyone, a lot of fans ever wanted to see in a Marvel movie that we hadn't seen before. Or fan favorites like, again, and who doesn't love Peggy, seeing her come back in live action as Captain Carter. Uh, and then you get them all in one room and it's all setting up for if this was Spider-Man No Way Home, they would have a scene of them all trading quips and then having a big hug and fans would feel very happy. But this being a Sam Raimi movie, it's a setup for them being slaughtered inside of two minutes. Peggy literally says, I could do this all day. And then she is cut in half. Like, uh, it, it's honestly, I do wonder if there was some argument over, could there be a shadow effect? <laughs> because... I mean, he films it the same way as the Green Goblin's death, but the fact that he's doing, you know, sudden, sudden insert extreme close up of her reacting in shock at what just happened. But the fact that they're doing this to a hero that fans want to see, I mean, there's something very subversive and mean, but again, I think very playful that makes this to me much more satisfying than just seeing a fan favorite character, you know, trade jokes with another one. We definitely need to dive into the Illuminati and to Wanda. But one final point on the multiverse uh, to what David said. It is weird that we, maybe not weird, but it's an interesting decision that we only spend time in like three different multiverses in this movie. But even stranger than that to me is when Strange asks America how many um, different universes he's traveled to. She says 72, which feels like unbelievably low to me <laughs> like if we uh not that there's only 72 out there but even the fact that she's only been to 72 and she's so learned and, and like has all these rules built up for the multiverse travel um that was a little odd before we move on from the multiverse i just want to pose a question to everybody which is does it really feel after this movie like the multiverse is quite as important to the future of the MCU as it was being built up to be with Loki and then the marketing for this movie. Because for me, it kind of felt like this was like, okay, we did it now. Like now we're going to, we're going to move on. And, and, you know, like we've established that all this stuff is, you know, that anything is possible. Any of your faves can be canon if you want, blah, 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 blah. And now we're going to move back on to the usual kind of linear storytelling of the MCU. But am I the only one who got that impression? Geez, I hope that's the case. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Because <laughs> this this multiverse stuff can get, can just get exhausting and, and an excuse for references in the place of story, which Marvel is already always running the risk of. So... Um, I, 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 I hope so. The only thing that lingers, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later, is all this talk of incursions. Um, uh, hopefully that's setting up for something way down the road, or it's setting up for, you know, immediately we're going to do what the incursions are in the comics, which is wiping out the entire multiverse. So it's going to go away regardless. So the, the, the fact that that's kind of hanging over the, the story makes me think that they're maybe not done with multiverse yet. But I'm at the very least hoping that they're going to push that off until, you know, the, the, the climactic whatever Avengers Infinity War endgame is for this set of phases, then we can get back to it. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think I, I did get that sense as well after this movie that the multiverse isn't as crucial to Marvel's next phase of storytelling as we've been led to believe. We'll have to get through quantum media first to know for sure, because I think that's like kind of the next big stepping stone. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they were just happy to introduce it for like a rainy day later. Um, I think it's important that um, that our reality in this movie gets the 616 name. Uh, if it hadn't already in canon, I can't recall. Um, and I think it's important that we get introduced like at least a couple more multiverses. But I do get the sense that like uh, they're kind of ready for a slight return to normalcy. Quantum mania pending. <laughs> I will say, I think that they've taken this almost, not, well, obviously not as far as they can go, 
but they've taken it for the reason fans really want to see it, which is, again, seeing your fan favorites. That would be No Way Home. And this does that, and we'll get into that a little bit as well. But this is a very comic booky story in that it's very standalone. It's like, isn't this a crazy idea? And we're going to use it to tell this one little adventure. And it doesn't feel like it's setting up a ton of Marvel movies. That said, I do think the multiverse as a concept is something they're going to, as uh, Alec was saying, not only keep necessarily as a rainy day, I could see them using it to explain continuity issues down the road. But given how it seems to me just perusing social media this morning, some people, you know, have issues with how, frankly, nerdy this movie is and how, how hard it is to follow already with all the canon going on. I think they would be wise to step away from that to, to lean or to lean too hard on that for, and, you know, just out of curiosity, since I haven't been following the, the uh, official, you know, language that's been put out there, I didn't even know the MCU was called 616. I thought that was the uh, Marvel comic books. So I think it that- is. And I feel like somewhere, somebody even nerdier than me is really angry about this because like, for example, DC comics, the way that they, the way that DC has designated the worlds of their multiverse, they've been much more kind of consistent with it. Like what they set up in the comics and what they set up on TV, like occasionally there's a little crossover there, you know what I mean? But like in some ways, like for a while, like they did say like, you know what, the DC animated universe is on this earth, you know, as opposed to whatever. So Marvel had a chance to kind of, you know, get it right. If you actually care about this stuff, like I don't even care about this stuff, but Marvel had a chance to kind of get it right out of the gate and give this a distinct universe distinction, like a like number different from the Marvel Comics universe, which is officially 616 as well. I don't know. You know what? I don't care. Like the multiverse stuff gives me a headache on the best days. Like, and I've never really followed its logic as closely as I've become like, um, you know, I'll talk DC, I'll multiverse lawyer with you all day long. Like, but with Marvel, I, I kind of don't care. So I feel like somewhere somebody's really upset about this, but it's not me. Like, <laughs> you know, I wanted to move on and talk about Wanda, but since we're so deep into the multiverse chat right now, we should talk about the Illuminati before we go any further. This was honestly what I was kind of least looking forward to in this movie. It was like the, the portion of the movie that I was most dreading. Uh, because I'm sick of fan service. I am just sick of the masturbatory fan service. I am the only person on the planet who absolutely despised Spider-Man No Way Home, you know, and I just don't think we need it. But as David said, this whole Illuminati sequence did subvert expectations. It didn't take up the entire movie. It kind of moved along, you know, it moved things along and it was fun. I was just hyped to finally see the MCU Fantastic Four acknowledged in some way, you know, like the fact that it was John Krasinski, I don't really care. Like, I know that's been a big fan cast for years and like, I've never really cared. I've never really like cemented my vision of who Mr. Fantastic should be. I just know it should not be Miles Teller. And so like, I was just hyped to see that and see the costume looking awesome and like the little references there. Um, But you know what? I didn't need to see Patrick Stewart as as Xavier again, you know, like, like, I really didn't like, you know, the 90s references are nice, but like, why cheapen what we had in Logan there, but like, pound for pound, I mean, what does this take up 15 minutes of the whole movie? That was pretty cool. I loved it. Like, um, David made this point earlier, and I'll just uh, re-articulate it in my own words, because that's what I do. I just copy David. In a lesser movie, like, say, Spider-Man No Way Home, which I didn't hate as much as Mike, and in fact, I didn't even hate it all. I kind of liked it, but it's definitely not as good as this movie. Um, in, in a movie like that, like, the cameo is the point. Like, that's the reward in and of itself, is like, look who we got. Look who's on the call sheet. And we're so far into this whole superhero movie making paradigm that just that's not enough anymore you have to present somebody interesting or some people interesting and then do something interesting with them and that movie absolutely does this here it it, it, um 
it kills them in the most amazingly violent way possible. Violent is my favorite word for this movie. I'm just obsessed with the violence in it. Um, just because I don't, I didn't imagine, when I walked into a theater, I did not think I was going to see the star of Inhumans brains explode on screen. Um, it's just a wonderful, it's cheeky, it's surprising, it's funny, and it's just wildly entertaining. Um, and it takes a scene that could have dragged the movie to a complete halt. And I feel like it actually elevates it instead. Yeah, and just on a, um, just on a pure, you know, we've got to deliver some exposition about the book of the Vashanti and all that sort of stuff. It's hard to go wrong with having Patrick Stewart deliver your exposition. I mean, and that's, and that kind of worked for me that he just, you know, I mean, I, 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 by that point in the movie, I was so on board with it that I was happy with what the cameos were doing. Like I, I, I smiled when the, the X-Men animated theme comes in, you know, when he's using his space chair along. Um, but really what the, the, before um, their heads explode, the function that Patrick Stewart's really serving there is to explain plot nonsense. And because I didn't care about the plot nonsense, it was just nice to listen to Patrick Stewart's voice. And, you know, again, if you're going to have somebody explain stuff to you, why not have Patrick Stewart do it? So I was pleased with all of that. And to echo what everyone's saying, I, I, again, I mean, the plot, as in the mechanics, it's all magic gibberish. Uh, I, I know Steve Dicko had rationalism. It's all magical gibberish. But to me, the plot is, the point is to subvert the expectations. And that is the pleasure from it. It's a very visceral sense of humor which to me is very rewarding. And to use an example, just, uh, uh, well, when it comes to Reed Richards, so that so that's interesting because, you know, he's been t uh, toying with doing this in the public for a long time. I like to think I got him in trouble when I mentioned this to Emily Blunt and she got very annoyed with both the question and that she found out that he's been fanning that flame. She's like, he's been saying that? So, uh, I think that was fun, but to you to look at Xavier. So Patrick Stewart said he was done after Logan. He said this was over, and I really, I still really like a number of those X Men movies, especially Logan. And I think he brought such a gravitas to the role. Why, why do it again? But beyond just giving exposition, he brings in audience familiarity. He brings in a sense of fan service, if you will. But as soon as you get him in the uh, horror movie sphere or horror adjacent, the vibe that Sam Raimi's setting up, you have this, I think better than any X-Men movie ever did it, scene where he's entered someone's mental dream state. And it's honestly looks a little bit like a psychedelic or Apple store anyway, version of, uh, <laughs> uh, of like an Evil Dead movie where she's trapped in the proverbial cellar, the good Wanda or the suburban Wanda. And as he's trying to get her out, the audience knows what's coming. It's heavily foreshadowed for the kids to know to close their eyes because they see the red mist coming. So it, again, it's very horror light, but it builds up the anticipation. And then to see Wanda take this beloved character and uh, basically go evil dead witch on him and snap his neck with like a claw I don't know. I, I think that's the type of scene that will, again, make some, you know, kids jump, but it's also going to make them love this movie and want to rewatch it. And I think that's great to see in the Marvel Universe. In addition to, like, we're talking about, like, kind of the purpose of the scene, and, and, and you guys have said that you accurately that part of it is to kind of soften the um, expositional burden. And David, you kind of touched on it a little bit as well, but it's also to just like firmly establish Wanda as just an unbreakable badass. Because it feels like for several movies and TV shows and projects in a row now, um, they've been really working to establish her as one of the most powerful characters in the MCU. And it's one thing to say that over and over again. It's another thing to have her kill five like unbelievable cameos in the span of like two minutes yeah the whole thing is just a, a roaring success the, the the illuminati portion of this film i do want to move on from the illuminati but i do think it's important to point out that like this is not uh patrick stewart as the charles xavier of those x-men movies like this is very much 
a new Xavier of Earth 838, right? Even the John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic thing, while I think he would be great casting within the MCU, all this does is confirm that these characters do exist on the prime MCU timeline, right? On the sacred MCU timeline. Um, it doesn't mean, as we have seen elsewhere, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have to be played by the same people. Like, I'm absolutely certain when we meet, you know, when we finally do meet the MCU's Professor Xavier, it's not going to be Patrick Stewart. It's up for debate whether it would be um, John Krasinski or not. I think it would be great if it was, you know, but there's no reason that it can't be, you know, any number of other people because, you know, we've seen from Loki that just because somebody is a variant, like, it doesn't mean that they are, that they are a twin, you know? I like where this is going. Um, I'm just, I'm a big Fantastic Four fan and I'm i am anxious to see this franchise finally get off the ground and finally be done justice uh, on the big screen. Letting Wanda just run through them like a hot knife through butter is, um, is pretty great. And, you know, David had actually texted me right after the screening. He said, best dark phoenix movie ever and i'm like yeah like that's that's basically what this was like this this was finally you know this was finally our dark phoenix movie that like nobody's been able to get right but it's interesting too because it is faithful to comics wanda in other ways because wanda has been a writer's punching bag for most of my life you know and so much of wandavision and this movie is like pulling from a really icky west coast avengers story from like the late 80s joe is smiling because i think he knows which one that is um and you know on the one hand it's great that possibly the mcu's best villain is one of their heroes right and elizabeth olsen is just so spectacular in this on the other hand it kind of undoes a lot of you know, a lot of the emotional work that was put in in WandaVision, you know, and it kind of sweeps a lot of that under the rug. So curious where, you know, where other people fall with Wanda's arc here. The segment you've all been waiting for. Four <laughs> dudes talking about Wanda. I know. <laughs> I know. I apologize. And I really, really wish Kirsty was here. Uh, not that we're not lucky to have David and Joe joining us, folks, but like Kirsty has been really, really critical of this movie. Uh, unfortunately, you're stuck with four dudes today. I am a dude and I will talk about Wanda. Um, I, I I definitely see it. Like I, I, that seems to be the most prevalent criticism for this movie. The fact that it undoes a lot of what they do with the character in WandaVision. And I think that's entirely fair because I, I mean, I loved WandaVision. I watched all nine episodes at least twice. And I really, really do not believe that the ending of WandaVision blends seamlessly into the beginning of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness in terms of her character arc. Um, At the end of WandaVision, it is relatively hopeful and bright and cheery. Like we do see her playing around with the Darkhold, which is, I suppose is ominous, but it's only, I think it's only ominous in hindsight, knowing what we've known. Like I, I, I just don't think the end of WandaVision properly sets up what happens here. But I don't know if I can blame Doctor Strange for the sins of the MCU overall and not properly setting up an arc in between films. It it is jarring at first. It took me a minute to adapt to and like accept that Wanda is the ultimate villain in this movie just because of my knowledge from WandaVision. And I feel like maybe it would have been a good idea to just like come right out with this twist in the marketing material just to like get people primed for it so they can kind of retroactively try and justify what happened in between WandaVision and Doctor Strange in their heads. Uh, But once you do kind of uh, buy into it and suspend your disbelief, I think it makes for a truly awesome, fun Terminator of a character. Um, And just her as a villain in this movie in a self-contained fashion really works for me. I thought it was so cool. To to give another dude's perspective, uh, I... I, I think the criticism, and I, I haven't heard it from Kirsty, who I wish was here, but I've heard it from uh, other writers, other women who have had that criticism of it. I think it's entirely valid. I do want to say that I do think that there is a space for Marvel to have 
uh, to let one of its most complex characters who does have a heel turner becomes an anti-hero, anti-heroine to be a woman. I think that there is space to have that nuanced depiction. I think in this particular instance, there's a fair criticism though that frankly, the female characters of the MCU are fairly underdeveloped in the sense that I think Wanda was one of the few that had an interior an interiority created really by Wanda Vision. The same way it wasn't until Black Widow, I feel like we really got to know who Nat was as a person beyond I'm an Avenger and I'm here to help my friends. The fact that the women are really underdeveloped despite whatever CGI shots they'll put in Avengers Endgame is a problem here. And Wanda is probably their most interesting uh, female hero. I, I think there's a space I think it's kind of cool that she's also allowed to be the one to be the Terminator, as uh, Alex said, to be the one who gets to just wreck other heroes in a way that you do not see in the MCU. That to me is fun, but I see the criticism and I do wonder if this is a case of Marvel, uh, Marvel's brain trust, not knowing how good or what they had on their hands with WandaVision. WandaVision was not supposed to be the beginning of the MCU's TV foray that, or the Disney Plus era. That was supposed to be Captain America and the Winter Soldier. WandaVision was the weird little side experiment that because it was shot like a sitcom for half of its run, it, it finished first, so it aired first. And it probably was airing around the time they were shooting this. So this movie was locked in. I don't think Marvel realized that they had created a really rich character with Wanda and Elizabeth, how much Elizabeth Olsen's performance affected people. And I wonder if, uh, if they had had a little more time between WandaVision and this movie, if it had, would have gone a different direction. Yeah, there, there would have been, uh, there's a possibility too, that we could have more time to showcase some of the other female characters as well. You know, we've got Ms. Marvel coming up and we've got uh, She-Hulk, the Marvel's movie, you know, they're, they're slowly getting around to finally giving uh, some female characters attention. Um, and, and so I, j just to be the last dude to also talk about Wanda, um, I think part of it has helped for me, and David, you kind of touched on this, is that Elizabeth Olsen's performance in this movie is amazing. She goes all the way into it. She, she is just chewing all the scenery as a wonderful villain. And, and I, I, I think part of it, I mean, and she does great when she's 838, um, comforting Wanda as well, but there is just so much glee in her performance that I can't, I can't be upset at um, uh, what's happening to the character uh, just because the actress is throwing herself in it and is just wonderful. I mean, she is far and away the best performance in this movie for me. And I, you know, half of what I'm enjoying there is the way that she is 100% game for the craziness that's going on. She is leaning into her, you know, uh, chasing the, the the heroes down like she's Carrie White covered in blood, you know, and, and, and throwing things around. It's awesome. And the way that she's like sneering that dialogue when she's floating around Kamatage, it's awesome. And so I, I, I totally hear all of the problems that people are saying, and those are all 100% valid. Um, they're bouncing off of me in part because, of course, I'm a dude, but also because I'm just so bought into the performance that I can't get bothered with any of, uh, of, of the plot stuff. I, I see Lisa over there saying top five MCU villain. And yeah, I think Wanda's a top five MCU villain for me, especially in this movie. Easily, easily. The, the word that comes to mind with Elizabeth Olsen's performance here is effortless. And when you think about this character's progression from when she was introduced in Age of Ultron to how like how she was used in Civil War to like, you know, to, to the little bits that she was in in Infinity War and Endgame, and then to WandaVision and this, I'm having a hard time thinking of another character in the entire MCU with a progression like this, not just a character progression, like as written on the page, but like as a portrayal as well. And it covers, it does cover a multitude of sins. It really does. Like, it's just so good. I think also part of the problem maybe is that the MCU itself just sucks up so much oxygen in the film space mm -hmm. for the point where they have to be mindful of stuff like that because like the the screenings of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness are probably replacing a lot of like smaller 
indie movies that featured three-dimensional uh, women characters that could have been at the cinema. So yeah, it just like the MCU is such an enormous beast unto itself that I feel like if you view this as like playing with your action figures, it's so cool. <laughs> it's so awesome and it works so well. Um, but unfortunately, just by, you know, the mere fact that it's the top dog in town and it, it carries so much oxygen of the rest of the film industry, um, it has to find a way to have its cake and eat it too. We have to have complex Wanda um, who's believable and then who believably transitions into this wild monster. Yeah. And I just feel that too much of that happens in between WandaVision and Doctor Strange. Um, either the tail end of WandaVision needed more of that transition or the very beginning of Doctor Strange needed more of that transition. There's just like a missing link between the character that I feel like makes the makes the transition more awkward. And it really, I really did take me like five to 10 minutes in the theater to like get used to it, to like fully accept that like, oh no, Wanda's like, she's really out there. <laughs> like we're really doing this. You mentioned movies that are losing oxygen right now. If you live in an area where they're still showing everything everywhere all at once and you haven't seen it, there's a great multiverse movie with a great complex, several great complex uh, female characters, actually dozens of them when you factor in the multiverse. It's wonderful. And see the Northmen as well. That's very masculine, but the women have several really amazing scenes that turn that movie on its head. And as the film editor, I wanted to just bring those up. And just to echo, I do think Elizabeth Olsen carries this in such a way. I mean, obviously, Raimi's having fun by just having her literally go witchy and devastate uh, whatever that timeline was we spent a lot of time in. But I think Elizabeth Olsen's performance, to me, it does feel of a piece. I see her grieving. I see her still, it feels of a piece of WandaVision if you take away that scene that didn't really work for me in WandaVision, which was, they'll never know what you gave up, where the, whatever, the shield or FBI or whatever she is, is just telling Wanda, it's okay that you completely held this town rant, uh, hostage for three months and mentally tortured them. And Wanda's like, yeah, I, 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 I feel better about it. So it's fine. I think that this does tie together. I don't think that this had to be the direction they took Wanda and maybe it shouldn't have been, but Elizabeth Olsen really makes it work for better or worse, I think in this movie. This is one of those things that I think will only kind of reveal itself to us, like as the MCU continues to unfold. And also like after, you know, after we've seen this movie again, like I am super high on this movie after a first viewing, I'm curious, I'm really curious to see if it holds up, you know, it's like Ragnarok holds up on multiple, multiple viewings, you know, Guardians holds up on multiple viewings. Like if, if, if this movie stands the test of time, the way some of those do, then great. If it turns out that there is more for Wanda to do here, even better, because I don't know, like, is, is this really where this character's story should end? You know, like it's a dark ending, like it's a dramatic ending. It's, an, it's a dramatically appropriate ending, but you know, is, is, is this really how we want to see Wanda go out? She didn't go out. Is there a body? She's around. Yeah. She will have a redemption arc film. I, to quote Doctor Strange, I don't think she's going to be on the lunchboxes anymore for like the Avengers team ups, but she will show up in an Avengers movie. And honestly, she'll probably be more badass than the rest of them because she has this dark, edgy backstory. I, I, think, uh, I think we haven't even seen half of her journey yet. Of course, now there's the... Um... You know, there are the matters of like the other wider connections to the MCU. And this movie introduces some serious comic book concepts in the form of the incursions, uh, which are straight out of some very recent uh, Marvel comics. Like Jonathan Hickman did in like an incredible, like epic, like in the true sense of the word run first on two Fantastic Four titles and then on two Avengers titles and a lot of those concepts about the nature of the multiverse and what happens when these universes like kind of start encroaching on each other and everything else and it all leads to as far as i'm concerned the only truly great comic book crossover event since the original crisis on infinite earths 
and that is Secret Wars. And, you know, Secret Wars has been rumored to be part of, you know, part of the grand plan for the MCU for a long time now. And Multiverse Madness makes me think there might be something to that. Now, Alec and David are not major, like, new comics readers, but Joe, I know, has has dug deep into this. How does the ending of this movie kind of, um, you know, kind of nod, and the concept of incursions in general kind of nod to what might be coming in phase five or six of the MCU? Well, that's a good question. So incursions, if, if it wasn't clear from the movie or if you haven't read the comics, incursions are when two uh, Earths from different universes kind of share the same space. And so the Hickman run that, that Mike's referring to is it's it's like an eight year long story and it is a proper the new Avengers run that he does is a proper superhero horror story it's amazing but um so it's it's these two Earths start to come together and in a span of eight hours they will run into each other if they run into each other then that entire universe both universes die and so much of that story deals with the heroes trying to decide is there a way that we can separate these two Earths without destroying the other one? And spoiler, the answer is often no. And so they have to make some really dark choices. That's what the comic book story is. This is where I'm a little bit confused on how this is going to work in for the MCU because Secret Wars leads up to the Marvel version of Crisis of Infinite Earths where it's basically there are no more multiverses. There is just one Earth that they remake. And so... It seems strange to me that Marvel would be so big, like we're gonna introduce the multiverse, then also we're gonna get rid of the multiverse, you know, because that was when DC did it, it was like what, 30 some odd years or 20, 20 close to 25, I suppose, building up to we're gonna re get rid of the multiverse. So that's why I kind of think the incursions are gonna be something that's gonna hang out in the background. Maybe when we get to the Kang arc, uh, that will they'll deal with that. And maybe by then we're all sick of multiverses and. Marvel can wipe them all out and be like, yeah, we were playing on it the whole time anyway. But that's a threat that's out there. It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's good comics. Read if you, and especially if you don't think that if you watched Mr. Fantastic in this movie and you're like, I don't get the big deal. Go read Hickman's Fantastic Four and, uh, and, and all the way out through Secret Wars. It's amazing. And then you'll get really hyped up for Dr. Doom as well. Good stuff. Uh, uh, yes, question for the, yes, David. Uh, do you think that uh, as some... Yeah, I read a lot of Marvel when I growing up. Like anything before the mid two thousands, I'm very familiar with, and then it gets tricky. So, is there a way to use this to introduce the X Men or mutants into the MCU? Because that's the big, you know, million dollar question. Why? Where are the X Men if they exist in this universe? Or why do humans like the Avengers, but? are afraid of mutants. Could the multiverse be a backdoor way into explaining all that? It could, but I really hope they don't go that route. I think it I think it cheapens the entire concept of the X-Men. I think it totally like blunts the social metaphor of it if it's just like, well, there was an incursion and now there's mutants. You know what I mean? It's like it's very very simple. Like you want to know why Nobody's been talking about mutants in the MCU to this point. When I was a kid in the 90s, it was a massive, massive deal when somebody in my high school came out of the closet. There were only two out people in my entire high school in the 90s, okay? People just were not as open about things as they are now. In all the ways that society is finding ways to backslide, like as we speak right now, we were a much more conservative, less accepting society 30 years ago than we are right now, you know, despite the best efforts of some of our worst lawmakers. Now, if the mutants have like for years been used, you know, first as a metaphor for anti-Semitism, and then later as a metaphor for homosexuality, and then like, you know, like, like the mutants are, are always the other, there is no reason why we can't just back into this story about like, look, mutants have always been here. You know, like they're just not talked about on the news, you know, like they're just not out there wearing costumes and saving the world yet. When the X-Men finally emerge in the MCU, it should mean something. It should matter. It should be a story that has resonance for the people that these stories are meant to truly resonate with. 
you know, and just bringing them in because of a dimensional portal or whatever is, is, is cheap. You know, I, I really stand by that. Like, I really think it would be, it would be a travesty if it would be lazy at best, if this is how the MCU decides to bring in mutants, I really do. Um, and I, and the, like, and you folks know, I'm not a continuity lawyer with these movies. I'm all about changes from the comics. You know what I mean? But the X-Men, the X-Men should be important. And especially at this very moment that we find ourselves, this dangerous moment in history, we need that story and we need it to be done right. You know, I'm sorry. I'll agree. Yeah. I didn't mean to go so long on that. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. <laughs> the post credit scenes, you know, one is obviously just a fun nod to how much Sam Raimi loves to torture Bruce Campbell. <laughs> and the other introduces, you know, the character that everybody has like kind of been wondering, like, where is Clea, like since 2016? But a lot of people don't really recognize this character. So I'm, I'm curious for, you know, Alec and David, what did that, did that post credit scene mean anything to you at all? It, it meant I got to see Charlize Theron. That was like, <laughs> that was it. I was like, holy sh oh God, it's Charlize. All right. <laughs> as far as I know, it's, it's canon that that is actually Charlize Theron as a magic user. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I could buy that. <laughs> I'd never heard of Clea in my life until I read our article earlier today. Yeah, to echo what Alex said, I was like, oh, that's Charlie's. No idea who the hell that is. Uh, didn't mean anything else. I thought it was kind of both fitting because, you know, this is a Marvel movie, but a shame that they walked back the horror ending where Strange is like, yeah, I'm cool with three eyes now. But <laughs> yeah, otherwise, it was just like, oh, it's nice to see her. If she's going to be in a franchise movie. It's nice to see her in some good ones. No offense to the Fantastic or uh, the Fast and Furious movies, but anyway. Joe, you want to tell the audience about Clea a little bit since, uh, since you wrote that great piece for us, which yeah. you should read at dennygeek.com slash Marvel, folks. What are you doing? Go read Joe's stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was just happy it wasn't another pop star that I didn't recognize since I had already been assigned to write the post credit scene. I was a little worried that we'd have another Eternals thing. Um, the So Clea is uh, the it, kind of, this is the minute of, uh, demeaning way of putting it, I know, but this is kind of how they, she's usually treated, is Doctor Strange's love interest most often. But kind of before that, she's from the Dark Dimension, which is that place that Doctor Strange goes to at the end of the first movie when he bargains with Dormammu. Um, she is she is from that dimension. And she is another sorcerer. Currently, I believe in Marvel canon, she is the, uh, the, the Sorcerer Supreme since yes. Strange is, is technically dead um, right now. So uh, she's another powerful sorcerer who has connections to Dormammu. Um, and the fact that she's recruiting him to bring him over to deal with incursions and the fact that his third eye opens on a filmmaking level that totally undercut the cool ending that Campbell or that Raimi initially had. If you, if you know the comics, that kind of sort of thing, it is a slightly darker ending that he is, he and his third eye are going into the dark dimension with a relative of this interdimensional evil from Dormammu. So um, big things for uh, Doc Strange 3, if we get it. I, um, I mean, I was hyped. And of course I knew who the character was like right out of the gate, but it did feel kind of like another perfunctory character intro, like we had with, you know, like Harry Styles as, you know, Star Fox is great casting. You know what I mean? But like, like even I don't care about Star Fox and you know what I mean? And that, and that post credit scene in Eternals just felt like obligatory, you know? And Clea is such an important character and make no mistake, Star Fox is not. <laughs> like, like Clea is such an important character that I almost feels like a little bit of a disservice to introduce her this way, you know? Especially when you have, when you have Charlize like playing her and like having her show up in broad daylight on a New York City street, kind of like, you know, there's, there's a line, there's a line in, in, in Watchmen, like, I, I think it's in one of the, you know, like, like one of the fake books in the course of Watchmen or whatever. And somebody says like, you know, when you're the only one showing up to a fight in costume, you start feeling pretty silly. You know what I mean? Like, 
I kind of got that vibe with that with that clear scene, which is a shame because this is a super important, super awesome character, a brilliant piece of casting. I'm way more interested in Doctor Strange 3 than I was before knowing that she's now part of the MCU. Um, but it's not really a great post credit scene, is it? You know, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing necessarily, but it strikes me as an interesting thing. And that's the fact that um, the MCU does seem more open to bringing in like real movie stars or just stars in general. Um, because like you meant like you mentioned Star Fox, and obviously Star Fox wasn't the important aspect of that scene. It was the fact that Harry Styles joined the MCU, which was literally the headline that you know broke embargo and made everybody mad. And now you bring in Charlize, and I I like it. It seems like a welcome direction, but it, it there's also maybe a cynical side of it. Whereas um, you know the MCU gets criticized a lot for kind of ending the era of movie stars like we used to go people would go see movies because of fellow human beings that interested them like Robert Redford or whoever and now it's more about the IP and the characters so it either feels like a um, charitable fig leaf to the world's movie stars to bring them in or a, a cynical subsumation of the, of the movies of the world's movie stars to bring them into this. I'm not sure what it is, but it is an interesting direction that we're getting more uh, really high-powered actors, actresses, and music musicians in the MCU now. I'll say Charlize is great, and the fact that she's now, whenever she's in a movie, all the comments on YouTube or Twitter will be, "Oh, it's Clea doing da 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 da." it will be able to let her finance probably some really interesting projects and including maybe another genre movie that folks would like to see her in like atomic blonde or something along those lines so if that if the, the combination of her movie stardom and marvel exploiting it lets her do something really interesting with it that's great any final thoughts before we sign off? We've run a little long today. I got to thank our audience for sticking with us. Yeah, I got to get one thing out there which is we we've, we've uh, you and I have mentioned a lot, like, I, if this feels like a top five Marvel movie for us, but we're not sure. We have to rewatch it. And I agree. Like, that's for I'll have to rewatch it to figure out where the film itself falls into the MCU. One thing I know for certain, deep in my very core, in my, in my bone marrow, is that um, the climax of this film with Doctor Strange dream walking into his own corpse, donning a cloak made of the screaming black skeletal souls of the damned and then battling a witch is the coolest thing I have ever seen in a Marvel movie. Yeah, and I don't know if the movie's top five, top 10, top 25, what have you. I just know for certain that that is my favorite climax in a Marvel movie ever. And I've thought about it constantly since I saw it. And that comes right after a music note battle. That's, I mean, we've gone long. We haven't even touched on all of the awesome stuff in this movie. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah it's a, we could we could go we could go a lot longer today. Like, <laughs> I just want to throw out like most Marvel action scenes for me. They personally, there are a lot of CGI. I kind of start uh, zoning out after a certain point in most of their action scenes. This no, there was so much creativity with the music battle with the way that the uh, Illuminati is slaughtered. And again, the fact that we basically see Doctor Strange almost dragged to hell in a Disney movie and then <laughs> turning those damn souls into his cape. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one of the best images, uh, special effects images I've ever seen in this uh, mega franchise. You know, it's worth, it's also worth remembering that the first Doctor Strange had a great climax too. Like, you know, like whatever oh, yeah. problems I have with that movie about being like kind of a traditional, like, you know, magic Iron Man origin story, whatever. The ending of that movie is great. You know what I mean? The fact that it didn't involve like a ridiculous, you know, a ridiculous battle and it was just like actual like creativity and negotiation and like fun stuff in that beautifully rendered dark dimension. So the Doctor Strange movies are now two for two with awesome, creative, you know, finales. And I got to I got to give it up there. Totally agree. Yeah. The Marvel Universe at large should definitely be looking towards the Doctor Strange conclusions for inspiration. It's about creativity and intelligence and thinking outside the box more so than, you know, spectacle, which has its place. But I think that is it for this week's Marvel Standom. It looks like we're taking a week or so off. 
But don't worry, because we'll be back soon to give you all the best coverage of the MCU in the entire multiverse. Uh, I don't know what Earth we're on, but, you know, you get the idea. Uh, make sure you're subscribing to us wherever you're listening right now. Don't forget to check out our web home at DennyGeek.com, where you can find all our Marvel and Doctor Strange coverage. And we have more dropping from Joe, from David, from me, all weekend long and into next week. So please read up, do your homework. We need you. Drop us a line. Let us know all your burning questions and what you want us to cover in upcoming episodes. You can do that by following Marvel Stanton on Twitter and Instagram. Give them a follow. We'll have some surprises there too eventually. Don't forget, we also have a DC show, which is due for a new episode one of these days. So check out DC Standem where you can on all major podcast platforms as well. Now, if you came in late today, don't worry. You can watch this entire episode on denigeek.com or at our YouTube home, Denigeek US, starting tomorrow. Don't forget, you can check out past episodes there and also say it with me wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, thank you to both of our guests this week, Joe George, David Crow. It is a pleasure always. Check out their stuff on thenegeek.com, please. Thank you to Andrew Halley, the best producer in any corner of the multiverse. Thanks to Den Geek social media coordinator, Reed Parham, for making sure you all behave yourselves. He's also running our TikTok now. Make sure you're following Den Geek TV on TikTok, on TikTok folks. Special shout out to Michael R. He makes the podcast version of this show all it can be and more. But most of all, thank you all for watching, listening, following, subscribing, putting up with my nonsense. This has been Marvel Standom on the Den Geek Network. And until next time, remember, folks, we stand together. Together.